Hi everybody, it's John Pushkar, and I'm here today with another episode to help keep you safe in the world of fuel systems and fired equipment. And today, we're going to talk about kind of a broad topic, but a vitally important topic. We're going to talk about risk management, business continuity issues, and we're going to talk about three big, somewhat obscure threats that I've identified that I've recently published a paper on. And I want to kind of bring these to the forefront. And I want to use some traditional business continuity management processes to help you understand the relative threat of these fired equipment issues to some more traditionally thought of threats like data centers being disabled or viruses on a computer. So let's take a look at how these might compare. There's a great paper published by the folks over at Deloitte. You might want to refer to it. I found it very useful and looks like a good planning tool for you. There are many methods for implementing enterprise risk management, and this BETH-3 method is one of them. This again in the next few slides are out of this paper that's available to you over the internet. But it talks about this BETH-3 method, which I found to be fascinating because BETH-3 is an acronym for looking at your buildings, your equipment, your technology issue, human assets, and then third parties that your business might be working with. And in this BET3 process, you start with analyzing each of those items, then looking to develop recovery strategies, and then looking at how you would implement these sorts of things. So in the analysis stage, they refer to NFPA 1600, and they talk about doing risk assessments, and they talk about the kinds of risks that might be out there. This is kind of neat. They look at doing a business impact analysis, talking about recovery time objectives you might have for certain things, recovery point objectives, minimum operating requirements, all really good stuff. And really good stuff that I've thought about for the fuels and fired equipment impact that could occur. And here's a little table that's provided mostly for data and software and technology type of recoveries. And you see it ends up there with what could be a seven to 14 day problem. Now, this is where I take issue with how a lot of this is done. I believe a lot of this is done with folks who really know nothing about what I'm gonna call our world, the fuels and fired equipment world, I'm going to show you now three somewhat obscure things that can go wrong in the fuels and fired equipment area that can easily, each one of these could take you out for weeks. It would make that seven to 14 days look joyful. The things that I'm going to be talking about could be devastating to your business. If you're a hospital, for example, if you're a paper mill, if you're a steel facility, a glass facility, any type of business where fuels and heat processing are really vital. And I'm not talking about fires and explosions here. No, I'm not even necessarily talking about safety issues. So stick around for the next few minutes, watch the rest of this episode, and you'll come away with three very important issues that maybe were never on your risk radar screen. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. So let's take up obscure issue number one. For me, that's failure of the underground gas piping systems that serve your facilities. Now, these could be on the utility side of the meter or on your side of the meter. You see, you change custody and you own the gas and the piping systems on the other side of the meter. To understand how bad it could be, you need to understand the repair scope. So it goes like this. Regardless of what side of the meter it's on, you first have to isolate the piping system. This is the first time you find out that valves that are underground 
they generally don't work. They don't work for long periods of time or they don't work well. So that could be quite a process, could involve a day or two to get properly isolated. Once you're isolated, you need to drain out the natural gas, the flammable material that's there, and you need to replace it with nitrogen. That's called the purging process. And there are codes and standards you need to follow to do that safely. Now you're into the fun part, the excavation part. And you've got to have people that understand how to slope the sides properly, use ditch boxes to protect people that are going to be in the excavation, and they've got to now start to identify specifically where the leaks were and how bad the repair might need to be. Consider the case of one of my auto clients years ago who happened to start excavating in a parking lot and found out that 200 feet of the six inch line serving their assembly plant was like Swiss cheese. In today's world of supply chain issues, you don't get a bunch of special six inch pipe at your nearest Walmart. It could be weeks to get that pipe, and it could be weeks to get the special corrosion protection system materials that have to be applied or that have to be attached to the piping system to protect it in the future once it's covered up again. So how do you mitigate or protect against this kind of scenario? Well, it's all about understanding the condition of what's buried there now. And on the gas utility side, they're supposed to be checking this annually according to the Federal Department of Transportation rules. If you ask for this kind of information, they'll provide it to you. And you'll understand the state of the piping that's coming into your facility before the meter. I had several staff members who worked for gas utilities and they said that many of them are years behind in keeping up with this type of assessment. It's like everything else, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you ask, you'll move to the top of the list, they'll assess your piping and you can track it. But now what about the stuff that's buried on your property? Is it even corrosion protected with a cathodic protection system? Is anyone even monitoring it? Has it been on anyone's risk radar system for years? In the 40 years I've been doing this, I've found very few facilities, regardless of size or the critical nature of that piping system, that were actually assessing these. Failures in these systems were a major, oh my gosh, how did that happen? And you know what, folks? They don't need to be. How about obscure issue number two? And that's under the category of refractory. So refractory is this cementaceous rock type material that protects the insides of boilers, ovens, and furnaces from the thousands of degrees that carbon steel can't tolerate. This carbon steel makes up the structure of the boiler or the firebox. It's where drums are supported or tubes are hung. It's the outer casing of this equipment that contains all of this heat and makes this equipment functional for us. Refractory systems have a design life. From the day new equipment is installed, there's a finite amount of time, a finite number of startups and shutdowns for that refractory. If refractory systems fail, let's again move to the scope of the repair process to understand how bad it could be. So first of all, you've got to cool that equipment down before you can even send people in to check it out. That could be a day or two. Once they're inside, they may need to erect special scaffoldings. These are very highly skilled people, specially trained. This could be confined spaces they're into, special PPE, breathing apparatus. They might have to do testing to make sure there's no asbestos in there or not a silica hazard or chromium hazard. Once you get through all this and they start doing some demo, then they can figure out if you've actually damaged any of the structural steel. God help you if that happened. Just to get some of the special refractory materials today could be weeks. Then you've got the other little pleasant surprise about working with refractories. Many of them are poured in place and they need to be cured. Curing is the process of maintaining very specific temperatures for periods of time, ramping up very carefully, having hold and soak times, getting to other temperatures for hold and soak times because you very carefully have to get the moisture out. After you've cured it properly, now comes a very careful startup process again. And everything I've spoken about here 
could easily be weeks in the making. How do you mitigate this risk? How do you get this effectively on your risk radar? A couple of different ways. First of all, infrared imaging equipment today is very inexpensive. For just a couple hundred dollars, you can get a cell phone attachment and do some good for yourself. For just a couple of thousand dollars, you can get some decent equipment that can allow you to do some relatively quick, inexpensive, very regular checking of the outside of equipment for refractory issues that are just beginning. I like to tell people, the longer you wait for a refractory repair, the repair time and scope goes up exponentially. Once you understand you have a refractory problem, get someone with refractory expertise in there right away to start to create a plan with you. The other thing that you should do is monitor the state and nature of startups and shutdowns. There should be a written procedure which makes for very careful, long, slow startups and long, slow shutdowns. Remember, carbon steel doesn't change and expand at the same rate as refractory materials. If you outstretch the refractory by starting up too fast or cooling down too fast, you'll start to break it and destroy it immediately. It goes into a death spiral that's not pretty to watch or to deal with. How about obscure issue number three? And that's boiler or furnace, tube, or mechanical integrity issues. And I'm gonna focus here on the case of boilers, but it's the same issue if it's a refinery heater, for example. The issue is that if your water treatment is not correct or you've got flame impingement on tubes, you dramatically reduce the useful life of this equipment. And it sneaks up on you. You can't readily observe the internal condition of tubes. And there are some failure mechanisms, especially in the water treatment world, which are catastrophic. If you start to have oxygen pitting, for example, it could just happen randomly throughout a number of different tubes. If you bleed through hardness and start depositing calcium and magnesium within boiler system tubes, you'll start to overheat them, blister them, and they'll fail. So again, to understand how bad this can be, let's go to the scope of the repair process. Again, just like in the case of refractory, these things have to cool down. You send people inside with special training. Again, there might be some testing to make sure there's no hazardous materials inside the firebox that they would be exposed to. They might have to set up scaffolding for access. They may have to cut out tubes to get to the tubes that may have failed. They may have to remove refractory, and there may be refractory repairs involved just to get to the tubes that need to be repaired. Now you're talking special ASME code repair stamp welders. You're talking inspections. Once they're all done, you're talking about a pressure test where everything's filled with water and the boiler is squeezed, as they say in the industry. Hopefully that passes. Hopefully you don't find more leaks. What I haven't discussed so far is where you might get some of these tubes. Some of them might be somewhat exotic in their metallurgical makeup. Once you get them, you likely have to have them bent or fabricated very precisely in an ASME code shop. Getting these tubes, getting the fabrication done, getting inside, getting it welded, getting the pressure test done, this could be weeks of downtime. How do you mitigate these risks? You do some really intense quality control management of the water treatment system. There are folks who have third parties review the water treatment that's occurring. There are folks who have put a lot of redundancy into how this is done. I'm providing for you also in the comments section a PDF of a paper that talks about doing LOPA, layer of protection analysis, on water treatment systems for boilers. And don't forget, Burners that are not set up properly, that are impinging flames on tubes, could also make for a premature life. So you need to have a daily flame observation program with people who are trained to understand what to look for, what impingement looks like, when it's bad, when things should be shut down immediately. You need to log this information. Hopefully you understand that there's a whole nother side to business continuity management. And the things I've talked about today 
although they're somewhat obscure, I hope you'd agree, they're every bit as important and could make for devastating consequences to business continuity, every bit as devastating and tragic as some software virus or an outage of a data center. So again, hope you learned something here that was valuable. Hope you can get these things on your risk radar. And although I didn't stress the safety aspect of these issues, those safety aspects are certainly there. There are boiler tube failures that'll fill a boiler house with steam in just minutes. There are refractory issues which can burn through casings and jeopardize the staff nearby. And certainly gas leaks are nothing to mess with. As I always say, the life that you save here, well, it just might be yours. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.